speaker talks. Okay. So family success during a pandemic. I'm very happy to have Cami Kelton here with me today to talk with you about this. Um, Cami is a longtime family therapist. She's one of those people who've been in the saddle a long time, seen it all, and has been actively working during this uh, pandemic now. So she's on the front lines, knows what people are going through. And she's got advanced training in Bowen Family Systems Theory and is on our faculty with the Vermont Center for Families Studies. Cami, good to see you. Thank you, Eric. I appreciate the opportunity. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to introduce Eric. Eric's a leadership, leadership psychologist and executive leadership development coach. He volunteers as the executive director um, with Vermont Center for Family Studies in the spare time he has when he's not coaching business leaders in his consulting firm, which is Thompson Leadership Development. So welcome, Eric. I'm glad to be doing this with you. Um, let's take a quick a couple of minutes or a minute or so to sort of go over the, the agenda for the day. Eric and I are going to spend about a half an hour talking and, um, and sort of having a dialogue about some different things that have been on our minds in terms of this situation we're all in. Um, and then we're going to break out into um, breakout rooms of about two to three people. Eric will explain uh, how that happens as we get to that point, um, where people will have a chance to talk amongst themselves and reflect on perhaps a couple of questions that we pose. Um, we'll come back from that and spend about 10 minutes um, with reports from a few of the groups and have a chance to uh, answer a few questions um, before wrapping up. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. And I just want to take a moment before we launch into uh, the chat that Cami and I are going to have to thank our sponsor, Pamela Real Estate. Um, I know this business does so much for the community. They're supporting the Flynn Theater and all kinds of things that are going on here right now. And also, um, really on the front lines with this, with lots of small businesses that they support, not the national Amazons, but the small businesses that are having a really tough time right now, paying rent to the properties that they manage. And it's kind of inspiring for me to hear Ernie Parmelo talk about how he's working with them and trying to help them out. So Cami, what have we gotten ourselves into here? <laughs> Um, my goodness, all kinds of things. Um, you know, Eric, as you and I have been talking over the last few weeks, um, we've shared some of our own reflections about things that we're noticing in this situation. And um, I'll just sort of highlight a few of those things you and I have talked about. Mm. Uh, when we were initially entering this situation, it was really interesting to me to observe my own and others' reactions. Um, as we were, I think, all preparing for the shelter in place sort of directive, we could sort of see that coming. And um, I think initially I noticed people a little bit in a frenzy of preparing for that, whatever that would mean for them personally and professionally. I found that to be the case for me as well. Gathering mental toilet paper, perhaps? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I had to, like, do I have enough? you know, hand sanitizer and toilet paper and food for, you know, however many weeks this might go. Um, so a lot of scurrying, kind of like a squirrel collecting acorns for the winter. Um, and it was so interesting that as people settled into the shelter in place, one of the, some themes I was hearing about were um, things like people actually kind of relaxing into it a little bit, feeling like, oh, this might there might be some opportunity in this. Um, people were describing feeling a little more relaxed, um, having more flexible time, um, some additional time with their families in ways that they don't normally have, um, being able to kind of step back from some of their normal obligations like work colleagues and um, a lot of activities and habits. Um, and letting go of some of those obligations um, and maybe making room for some new things. Um, some of the adolescents I work with describes feeling- That exactly describes what I did. 
<laughs> Does it? Yes, perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> you want to say more? <laughs> oh, we ripped out some disgusting carpet in one of the bedrooms here that's been bothering me for years, you know. Oh, yeah. Yes, and, and I must, I think I know where you're going here because that phase, okay. that phase is kind of over. Yes, it is. So, so what are you <laughs> seeing now? <laughs> yes, there has been a shift. And uh, as we shelter in place longer, I'm seeing, um, you know, or, and hearing more reports of irritability, boredom, tension in the family, challenges with living all together 24 seven, um, parents, monitoring children learning at home, college students home who are used to more independence and freedom now kind of feeling back in a fishbowl. So Eric, how, how, do how many college students do you think are out there noticing that their parents are involved back involved in their studies? Oh, <laughs> how involved should we be in our kids studies? Oh, my goodness. That's Delta a great at home. Question. Cammy Kelton. <laughs> <laughs> you think I have the answers? Well, I know that Cami Kelton has done a very uh, excellent professional presentations on the topic of launching the children, launching yeah. adults. And, uh, yeah, yeah so. it's made me reflect kind of back on that. Um, and I'm, I, I have to say I'm in a fairly fortunate position in that both of my kids are actually not at home. So I have to kind of... <laughs> Put that out there that some other some people might be suffering more than I am, um, but yeah, it has made me think a little bit about um, when I think when we're faced, particularly as a collective, it, 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 with a situation like this, it is so normal for people to want to um, in a in a um, socially responsible way and in a familiar way want to rush to helping right? Um, how do we help our kids that are at home? How do we help our, you know, elementary school age children to um, continue to learn? Um, how do we help in the larger community? So I think particularly those of us in the helping profession, we can sort of feel that pull on many fronts. Um, so that's got me thinking about, you know, what is it to be helpful? Um, Right, in, on many different levels. So, um, so I want to hear what you have to say about that. And just before, I'm going to just say, I'm seeing the same thing of, um, you know, the, the sort of the vacation part of it is, is over for a lot of people. Yeah. Um, I'm actually quite struck. You know, I, I, in my conversation with my clients, I get kind of behind the, behind the front page back into like what's really going on inside yeah. of them and in their house where they're most of them, many of them are stuck much more stuck together mm -hmm. and they're working mm -hmm. from home. And I'm really quite struck with the, you know, increased feelings of depression, increased conflict and irritability. Uh, I think it's predictable. And I'm going to say, talk a little bit, I'll get a little, a little a knowledge piece to share about that in a minute, but, um, uh, insomnia. I mean, I, I, I'll tell you, I am a fantastic sleeper mm -hmm. for decades. And I mm. went through a real tough period of insomnia last week, which mm -hmm. of course affects everything else. And it did for me. Right. Um, and it was surprising to me. It was like, what is going on here? And then it just hit me, you know, this global anxiety storm is hitting everybody very personally. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> That is very true. And one so of what do you think about this helping? What is really mm -hmm. helping? Mm -hmm. Share a thought or two about that. Okay. So, um, Eric, I shared this with you a little bit yesterday, but I have this, uh, there's a, a quote by the author Anne Lamott um, that I heard recently, and it, it has so stuck in my head. And she says, helping is the sunny side of control. Um, and I laughed out loud when I heard it because I, I could so identify with it. I see myself in that quote. Mm. Um, and so it really got me thinking about um, how do we see our role um, as a spouse, as a parent, as a therapist or counselor? Um, how do we really look at our role, you know, as a helping professional and wanting to be a helpful person? 
And a um, couple of things come to mind is, is one way we can see it is to identify with um, a sense of responsibility to help people fix what's going wrong for them, fix their problems, come up with solutions um, that will be helpful to them, providing answers, um, maybe trying to convince other people of our good ideas about what would be useful to them. That's one way to think about that role. Um, but I would suggest that there's all kinds of problems with that um, in that it's, it's more of an anxious helping. It's often um, when I get into that mode, I find my own anxiety uh, gets elevated because I think I have to, I have a lot of responsibility here. And so I get more anxious. Um, and the helping actually becomes a way to calm down, calm myself down, right? If I'm higher in anxiety and I can be helpful and it works, I feel better. Um, but yeah, there's probably it, quite a bit of frenzied, anxious helping going on right now. Yeah, um, yeah. Within yeah. by just what you described there. Yeah. And I don't think this is, um, I think I'm sure this is present in the business world too. I think there's a way that people can kind of get into an adrenaline dominated space about crisis. And one of the things that I imagine is happening is bosses sort of doing too much for the very competent people who work for them right now. Oh, interesting. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and I think that's, that is happening in some households, right? Of, um, you know, with, with everybody being under each other's purview, parents are probably more heightened in their awareness of what's going on with their kids and jumping in more automatically to um, suggest mm -hmm. things or do things or, um, you know, criticize or whatever as a way of trying to kind of yeah. hear or direct them. It's probably a good thing to think about for people who are dealing with an increase in tension in, in, in any one particular relationship, including one they might be watching, right. uh, like a wife watching a husband and a teenager or, um, you know, a husband watching a wife and a kid who's home from college, um, having the, them get into a really elevated tension state mm -hmm. to be thinking about what is anxious helping, what is anxious over helping. Right. Mm -hmm. And what does that look like, you know? You know, I'm thinking too that, um, what you mean, what does it look like to not? Yeah, what does anxious over helping look like? What can it look like? I think it's a really good question for anyone to just sit and ponder. Mm -hmm. what is, what's my version of anxious over helping? Yeah. By, by the way, is it helpful to tell people that they're not putting their dishes in the dishwasher, Cami? <laughs> Generally, is that a good plan? <laughs> Perhaps it's in how it's done. <laughs> okay. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> you can um, try it. It's an experience. It's an experiment, perhaps. I'm thinking about this with the with the constricted social space. Yeah. There's a constricted emotional space mm. that people are facing. And and um I, I want to talk a little bit more about that from a theoretical perspective in a minute. But that anxious helping when it's sprayed upon a constricted emotional space, mm -hmm. predictably gonna increase the sense of crowding. Yeah. Yeah. And do you think that 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 um, can help explain the increased tension we're seeing that increased crowding can can result in an increased tension between people? OK, I think that's my cue to show. Ah, some, some diagrams. Okay. Um, so I want to just take I, I you know, I was just thinking when we had this idea stuck together, stuck apart. Those words are so intrinsic to Bowen family systems theory, and I and I and I and I was thinking that this could be helpful. Just some basic theory that might provide people with some greater understanding of some of the dimensions of what they're going through. And so I just created a few images that I want to share with you um, to take you through this, you know, like a five-minute journey on these ideas. And so the first is that. Human beings, that there's a very fundamental challenge in being human. And it is this, that we are trying to balance adequate emotional contact 
We want that. We want to be comfortably connected, but we also want adequate emotional space. We want to be free. We want to be connected, but we want to be free. We want to, you know, have, um, have, uh, the resources available around us where, you know, if we, if we want to be together, but then we also want to be able to think the way we want to think. We want, we don't want to feel imprisoned by the way other people want us to think, for example. These are some of the dimensions of adequate emotional space. And in, uh, I've heard you know, wise bone people say, this is a fundamental dilemma for many relationships. It's the fundamental dilemma for couples, fundamental for parent and offspring, siblings who are close together. So this, this challenge, it's a challenge for humans and different humans handle it differently. So if you think about that as a kind of underlying backdrop to the situation the world is in right now with stuck together and stuck apart, it fits it very well and pressures mm -hmm. upon it. It adds additional pressure upon it. Mm -hmm. And I wanna speak a little about the variation in the degree to which people are predictably going to be pressured by this. So this is just a diagram of a, of a multi-generational family group, or this could be your work team, could be a, a school, could be a neighborhood, each dot being a house. And I'm gonna explain these colors and the variation in colors here. And in, in the diagram, for those of you who don't know, it's uh, traditionally, it's a multi-generational, so it would be the grandparents at the top and the children at the bottom, the grandchildren at the bottom. And so this is the state we're in. It's a, it's a real powerful impact on these units where they're, they're more contained and sort of, uh, you know, closed off from each other with a vacuum seal. And at the same time, the links between them are disrupted substantially. I know my kids are really, really missing school. They never knew how much they love school. Mm -hmm. And this is going to produce a, a very predictable effect. And I'm going to just speak a little bit more about how that happens. So fundamental concept about this variation in sensitivity to being stuck together and stuck apart is illustrated by this slide. These are two mother-son pairs. This could also be a couple, but let's just say for, or, or it could be uh, an, an aging grand, grandfather and his daughter, but let's just say for the sake of this picture, these are two different mother-son pairs. And this, this traveling path from left to right represents the first 20 years of their time together. So the idea here is that this pair and this pair resolve the deep natural dependency that they start from at different levels to different degrees. The resolution of the dependency varies among humans. So the pair on the top, they have a more easy interdependence, whereas the pair on the bottom, their inter interdependence is more complex, it's trickier. And it's trickier in this particular way, that this variation impacts the degree of reactivity they have to what each other does, thinks, and feels. So this variation in reactivity is, is pictured here, the, the pair on the left. Again, now let's flash it over. It's a couple in the blue. The lightning bolts represent the degree of reactivity they have between each other at a sort of fundamental basic level, not a moment to moment level, not you know whether they're having a bad week, but just over the course of the entire relationship, the degree of reactivity they have to each other. So this variation is very, very uh, real. I think this is a, a good description of nature. This is the way people are. And uh, the, the, group, the pair on the right, I've added a red pair highly reactive to each other. They have a kind of a sort of scratchy sensitivity or itchy sensitivity to each other. And I think it's just a simple, but perhaps I'm hoping helpful idea that the way people are going to respond, and here, here we have three different families in quarantine. The circle is their apartment or their house that they're packed together in. There's probably not many groups these days that are this large, but again, you know, the, the groups 
not just the dyads, but the groups vary. So the households in a neighborhood vary in the degree of kind of um, uncomfortable sensitivity they have to each other. And very predictably, this is going to result in a variation in how people respond to this situation. And the orange splashes are people who are, you know, having more insomnia or conflict or whatever it is they're dealing with. So I think we can be more free together and free apart, but it's tricky for humans and it's probably even trickier now. Mm. What do you think about that? I think that that's a really helpful overview to kind of talk about um, the variation in what we see in terms of how people are doing in these circumstances. Um, and in some ways, I think these circumstances can kind of be a, um, a laboratory for being able to really see some of that stuff more on the surface. So it gets me thinking about, regardless of where we are on that continuum that you um, helped us to see, how might we how might we in our own circumstance, whether it's professional or personal, um, identify or look at the degree to which we are um, um, struggling in that reactivity with others? You know, um, can we can we find a way to sort of step back and um, and observe what's happening with a little bit of a research lens. How can I understand what I'm experiencing in my own family or in my work? Um, I think your, um, your explanation might help people to do that a little bit better. To what mm -hmm. degree am I stuck with, um, you know, and in this interdependence uh, yeah, it's kind of like there's the there's this stuck together that's happening um, because it's the right thing to do right now. Mm -hmm. Amazing, it's adaptive in this mm -hmm. amazingly adaptive global response to protecting the vulnerable. Absolutely right. inspiring to me. Um, there's that challenge, but yeah. it's kind of like there's this underlying challenge of the emotional stuck to togetherness that that is laying down on top of. So I think you're saying this is an opportunity to be better at observing that, seeing it mm -hmm. more clearly. Mm -hmm. Perhaps, yeah, yeah. So what might, you know, how might, what might help uh, people to, um, what are some helpful questions for people to think about or ask themselves um, in that process? You know. Yeah, I know. Uh, that's I like that. And when when I had this insomnia thing last week, and I, it really struck me. Normally, if I would have a, a night uh, where I woke up at three and couldn't get back to sleep, I would be saying to myself, well, "Wow, what is going on? You know, with me? What's why is what's making this happen?" And it's really struck me that a lot of that kind of thinking wasn't really. Uh, it, it seemed obvious to me that what was happening right. was this was this kind of global event mm -hmm. that was was then pressuring in on, on important relationships in our house. But the fundamental driver wasn't really the parties involved or the personalities. Hmm. It was this other lying, underlying mystery. Yeah. And yeah. I think there is an opportunity in this and probably an imperative for people who want to be family leaders. Um, in helping the family cope with this, mm -hmm. to try to see beyond the sort of convenient handles of who's irritating me, say, or... Mm -hmm. uh, or I'm upset because you didn't put the dishes in the dishwasher. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, 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 you know, even deeper, like if there's a symptomatic person in the family, it could be a kid who's showing signs mm -hmm. of more depression, um, to, to kind of watch for those anxious helping instincts and maybe also try to step back and see beyond, mm. beyond the symptom and the immediate answer to what's the underlying process here that, is, that this is driving. Right. That's, that's one of the ideas that's really interesting in the theory is that the person in the group who's most stuck together with the group, like say it varies among siblings. Some kids are freer mm -hmm. 
with the family. They're freer even in quarantine than the one, there's ones who are less free. Those less free ones, and the bone theory presents this idea that it's the stuck togetherness that is really driving their symptoms, not, not even so much fundamentally um, their character. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's an interesting thing, like as a, if one wants to, like in, in a, being a family leader, um, what does it, what does it look like to be helping in a more effective way, you know, um, is one of the things I think about with all of this sense of wanting to be helpful. Mm. Um, you know, and one of the things that um, I think about is it's, it's perhaps not so much about um, always about what we're doing, um, but perhaps more about can I, can I cultivate a bit of a calmer presence in myself um, when I'm with my family? Um, that that, that um, may be enough of a shift to um, be able to think about some things differently or observe some things. Um, I, I think that's just such a great idea. And, and it reminds me, it does remind me of your work on uh, how did you call it launching the parent? Yeah. So wait, how did you put, <laughs> remind me of how you put it. Uh, I, I can't, I don't remember the exact wording. No, but You flipped it from launching the kid. Yeah, it was. The parent it, was yeah. Launching. Yes, that the process is really, um, for me, was more about my own launching um, to returning to my own life, to being a little bit more freed up in my relationship with my children, a little more differentiated. Um, way to get there was to launch yourself in some way. Yes. And I think yeah, that's, was, probably, yeah. that's probably a pretty good mantra for anyone who wants to be a family leader in this mm -hmm. situation. Mm -hmm. It's to kind of, you know, resist the temptation for the attention to go towards anxious helping. Yeah. And to turn it back towards being, being a presence. And what does it take? What's, what behaviors would it take to maintain a, a quality of presence that would be um, a greater resource for people struggling with this challenge of being stuck together and stuck right. apart. Yeah, it's a great question. And I bet the answers would be different for different people, you know, what that might look like. Um, I'm hearing a lot of people talk about the daily walk. Yeah, yeah. And, um, another one that I want to highlight that I, I've really been amazed um, one of my colleagues and longtime friend and colleague is done has been very active in setting up innovative zoom meetings um, multi-generationally mm -hmm. and reaching out also by phone or uh, for zoom if possible with elderly people who my mom is a right she's stuck in her room mm -hmm. not only is she in assisted living <laughs> she's in her room um, yeah. And, and this, uh, this idea of using Zoom in creative ways to, to have some new kinds of connections occurring during this time. Yeah. I think it'd be very relieving of and, and very poise generating for a family leader. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a, that's a really interesting idea and a lovely one. I do, I think about how um, we can get kind of caught in the content of the circumstance we're in, the details of it, the news of it, the where are we at in this. Um, um, and what I, one of the things I'm hearing is people are feeling very um, um, sort of dull in their conversations because this seems to be the only, one of the only things they're kind of talking about. Um, yeah. Yeah, it was, it was along what, what you're saying, I um, heard my daughter lives about 3,000 miles away and she recently, just this week, um, called her grandmother, who's my husband's mother, who's in assisted living and um, has some dementia. And she sent us an email of this beautiful transcript of their conversation of the kinds of things she asked her about, which had nothing to do with the current circumstances. And it was a, it was a, a very um, sweet reminder of 
um, the power of those sorts of conversations for both people, you know, that intergenerational, um, what else can we talk about? Uh, how can we be curious and interested in each other? I love that. Yeah. The, 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 one of the most senior epidemiologists in the U.S. has said that this virus is like Loki. It's a trickster, a deceiver, and a liar, and that mm -hmm. it tricks the body. And I'm thinking that it could also trick, mm -hmm. so kind of anxieties like that. It can trick us into thinking that what's really important to talk about is itself. Yeah. Whereas it might be something else. Right. So, you know, flowing with this idea that, that, you know, this can be a time when people can adventure and create new connections. We thought a lot about this and we decided we wanted to do a breakout 10 minutes during this meeting. So we're going to transition into that now. And Zoom has this wonderful capacity to, to do that. So what I was thinking is, you know, you, you maybe some of you might have an introvert, extroverted element. And you might kind of enjoy those little chats you had at the Starbucks or, you know, walking the dog with people you didn't even know. And you've lost some of that. So here's a chance to kind of go to a virtual Starbucks for 10 minutes and reflect on some of the things we've been talking about. So Zoom is going to put you into rooms randomly. Of course, you don't have to speak. Um, I think you have the option to return to the main room if you want to, but I'm gonna suggest don't spend a lot of time introducing yourself because you're only gonna have 10 minutes, it'll fly by. And um, I have some suggested questions for you to consider. Hmm. Are you seeing my screen? No, we're seeing um, all of our faces there. Now we can see your screen. So if you have a pen handy, you could just kind of note these if you want to remember them, because you won't be able to see these in the breakout. Pretty simple. And then um, when the breakout is finished, we'll, we'll have a chance to hear a little bit from some of you who've been in, in the, um, in the breakout rooms and um, and uh, hear what you've been thinking about. So um, I find in the public meetings that we do for VCFS, people get a lot of value from having time to think and having time to digest information that we put forward. And that's that's the spirit with which we are offering this breakout experience now. So I'm just configuring the breakout rooms here. All right, so um, this is gonna be 10 minutes and they'll just end automatically. You don't have to worry about that. See you soon.
Kirk, can you hear me? I'm back in the main session, Eric. So was your breakout working? Yeah, it was totally working. Okay. Well, if nothing else, they can. It's really interesting how this. Kirk, can you hear us? He doesn't have a microphone. Um, oh. So that's, I'm wondering. Yeah, if I don't see a microphone yeah. icon. Yeah, I had. I have three people who are together in there. It's interesting though. Our numbers went down when you announced the breakouts. We've we've been hovering. I took a picture of everyone who's been. Oh, you mean like a bunch of people jumped off? Yeah, so we went down from like 58 to like 45. So um, I, I don't know if it made people nervous, but I have a picture. Of I think the, also, you know, some people they just they just want a little bit. Oh, absolutely. No, it's yeah. it's been great. It's working great. And um, I definitely think no, my group seemed happy. I just excused myself because I said I just wanted to make sure everything mm -hmm. was working. Okay, so um, but there were three of them who were together. So also interesting that so many registered who didn't come. Yeah, I mean, I'm wondering if for some of them they're they they they're going to come next week. Like we'll send a follow up email. Oh, and and I did hear um, a couple tell me they were going to watch the recording. Yeah, I'm so not. You see know, I can move. Look, Eric, the fact that we've had 58 for I mean that's those are amazing numbers, and I think that um, yeah, this is this is great, and we can see what you want to do and you're you look great the background it all works the flower you and cami look terrific so thank you you're welcome um yeah kurt if you can hear us hi um, <laughs> <laughs> i'm assuming you can but uh we're happy to have you even though you're you know, uh, kurt, quite well and actually kurt and i have been texting a bit <laughs> oh really oh, that's <laughs> <laughs> no that's what you know Eric, like, you know, thinking about this for me, and I don't know if this is something for other people or a future topic, you know, once we got used to the quarantining thing and, and being home and going out with a mask and all of that kind of stuff, the part now I think that's causing anxiety for me is how do we open things up? And it's, it's not even so much, for me, it's things like flying, like when will it be safe? When will we feel safe? But I think about Noah and her industry probably can't open up until there's a quarantine. I mean, a vaccine, not a quarantine. And so, like that, the thing that, like, how is life going to change, and how are we going to adapt to that? That's the part that's scaring me. Like, I, LA is saying they don't see any concerts or sporting events until 2021. Um, I just got an interesting thing that Andrea Shera has asked for help. Oh, and it, okay. And it says I can join her breakout room if I want to. Do it. But I'm worried that if I do, I won't be able to get back. Oh, if you, there's a, do you know how to get back? Because I, no. I was able to. So if you, if you scroll across where you see participants, chat, share screen, all that stuff, there's yeah. a thing that says, it should say leave breakout room. Because okay. right now I did, that's, I clicked on it and I, that's how I got back to you. I think I'm just going to not do it. Okay, what does she need? I'm going to broadcast a message to them all uh, one okay. minute. Oh. I just realized this is... Okay, so now I'm going to call upon... Um, Kaylee, mm -hmm. and um, let's see, I also had Hadley and Carl, and I noticed that just as you predicted, Hadley or Kaylee and Carl are in the same breakout room. So we're going to just have Kaylee and then Hadley. Okay. And you're going to unmute them, right? Yep, I'm all set to do that. Okay. And, and are you, are you going to mute everyone when we come back? Yep, I am. I'm all set right, for so that. The, so the first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to do this now. I'm going to close the rooms in a minute, okay. in about 30 seconds. And then um, we'll have, we'll hear what, and you know, maybe they'll, so they might ask a question and then Cammie and I could kick it around a little perhaps. Sure. So who are we going to? I got to remember to wind down and um, tell people that we'll be back again next week to do this again.
and that we would yeah. appreciate feedback about the breakout rooms, whether to do that or not. Well, why don't we um, tell them we're going to send an email that they, where they can provide feedback. Okay. Yeah, and, and we can draft something up to send out like tomorrow. Yeah, or it's Monday. real simple. Totally yeah, yeah simple. just to say, you know, and then I, we can also say. Just for the meeting really, it would be like a one line. All right, here we go. Okay. Ready? I am ready. No. Oh. Here. Okay, welcome back. Um, so I would love to hear a little bit about uh, what what's going on out there, what you all are thinking about. And um, I was thinking, Kaylee, Stacy, would you mind uh, telling us a little what you're thinking about, what your questions are? Just curious, are other people hearing her, her um, audio? I think okay. that one of the things I'm hearing It's a little from... frozen. So let, let, me, let me try Hadley Bunting. Had, is Hadley available? Yes. Can you hear me? That's better, yeah. Okay. So we spoke about... Um, one of the one of the things we spoke about was a resistance to leadership that has come up um feeling like um we i think we understand that we might be called to be leaders in this time but we don't you know just the resistance that comes up to that it personally like within like i don't do i don't want to be a leader right now i just want to you know not be a leader so that was one of the things that, that came up for us. Oh, you're muted, Eric. Am I unmuted now? Uh, what questions are kicking around for you or people in your breakout about the situation? Sorry about that. Um, so let's see, what questions did we have? Um, I'll let you come back to it. Yep. One of the questions is what to do about that resistance to leadership. You know, what, how do you, how yeah. do you work around that, get through That's that? Brilliant. It's a very interesting point. Okay, thank you. Um, let's try Kaylee now just to see if that works, if, uh, your, if your computer is back. Okay. Um, one of the things that is standing out to me is how parents are managing this job motion that they didn't apply for and how they're managing their job along with what it means to manage their adoption. I'm going to stop there in case Thank you, Kaylee. Uh, it's still uh, audio, not not great. So I think I heard the basic question about balance, balancing, you know, I think so many people are dealing with this. That they're working at home at a whole nother level now. Um, and that that 
release of going away to work is is taken away from them. Um, so I want to get Cami back here as we as we wind towards the last part of our meeting. Um, and and see if you have any thoughts about what Hadley said. This, I think it's really interesting. This, I, I don't know if it's in, in the context of family, but that impulse to feel, I want someone else to lead. Mm. Uh, I can relate to that. Yeah. I think Bowen might have called that the helpless position. <laughs> <laughs> it it depends um, how one defines leadership. I think many people yeah. think it as a sort of position within a hierarchy, but I don't think of it that way. I think of it as any person who manages themselves in mm -hmm. such a way as to help the group meet its adaptive challenges. Yeah. So some of that resistance to leading could be a really healthy instinct that I don't really want to go into a kind of try to control everything mode right now. Yeah. You know, and that could be really intelligent because it's actually not what's needed. Yeah. Rather than just being kind of more having kind of how do I find my inner stillness right. and strength. Right. Yes. Right. The, I, I think that sometimes what we think of as leadership is, is having to have a certain kind of wisdom or knowledge or um, um, uh, being able to sort of tell people what they should, they need to do or what they should be doing in this. And I don't, I don't, I don't know that any of us know that. Um, so I think, I, I, you know, I think that's a really important point that it, that if we can really focusing, focus on um, managing ourselves, I think so much comes from that. And I think um, anxiety tends to um, create or uh, they go hand in hand but I think when we're for me I know that when I'm uh, when I'm overly focused on others it's the cue my anxiety has gone up right if I'm in management mode of other people um, I'm more anxious um, interesting yeah. Remember once I was sitting with a client and his wife was there and he had wanted his wife to come. He was really, really worried about his wife. Mm -hmm. Not so much about her, but he was worried about the way she was parenting one of their daughters. Mm -hmm. And um, they had gone through a trauma the year before. And, and this was all just, they were all kind of like, uh-oh. And I was trying to sort of connect with her and talk with her. And um, at some point I asked him, is this, I asked her, I said, dude, is this helping? And she goes, not really. And he, he turns to me, he was a pretty intense guy, hard charging. And he turns to me and he goes, you better do something different, Eric. Wow. And I knew this guy well, and I knew, I knew that was not his A game. And I was also thinking about like, how much responsibility am I going to take for what's happening right now? Yeah. And I said to him, I, just, I mustered the, the, the eye position and I said to him, that's probably one of the worst things I could do right now. Mm. And I remember it, it kind of pushed him back and he, he kind of like paused and he, he got it. Yeah. And, and then actually the rest of the meeting was really different. So that idea of, of um, part, you know, perhaps part of, bringing leadership is having that ability to kind of um, think about what am I and what am I not going to be responsible for, you know, and that there's probably no right or wrong answer for any particular question that people will come down differently on mm -hmm. that question um, for lots of reasons. Um, but asking the question is helpful to people. I think what what am I? What's what's my responsibility here? What is what is not? You know, um, I think that's very very uh, useful when we are um, in a position of trying to be helpful, but also managing our own experience in this circumstance. I love that. Yeah. What was going on in your in your uh, breakout? What what were you hearing? Um, uh, some reflecting on um, people's just personal experience of what what their situation is, and and um, this one 
um, person was reflecting on um, having adult, you know, college age uh, children at home and really working to not get in their way, but to kind of have, having this sense that they need to continue in their developmental path and I need to not be interfering with that. Um, but also the observation that in her um, um, parenting peers, there are a lot of people um, that are, you know, hyper managing their adult children at home and, um, and that there was a lot of sort of pressure to kind of join in that approach. Um, and this person was um, sort of feeling pretty, pretty good about being able to stick with their own thinking about that. So that was one thing we talked about. That's great. I just saw UVM has a University of Vermont Health Network has a really good website on the managing stress in the in the Corona thing, and mm -hmm. and and one of them was on this exact topic, and it it's just simple little sentence that said, um, from middle school on, one of the great imperatives is is that they're they're trying the kids are are seeking a greater level of independence. So obvious, right? Right. And that I mean, my kids are like heading out more than ever into the world that's so much of that has been disrupted and that's it's yes. really a tension generator mm -hmm. so, um, that that's interesting yeah we're just in the last few minutes i want to thank our sponsor again uh, pamela real estate they also sponsored our um, family um, meditation and family health last year uh, conference it was a two-day conference we're going to do another one this fall meditation and family leadership and also um so you know we we just we couldn't do what we do without them because we're really so reliant on volunteer energy and um it's it's just so so appreciated um what they're doing for us and um also to mention um that we're going to be doing this again next week it's it'll be a different uh topic it'll be a different discussion um we're kind of interested in knowing whether the breakouts work. So we're gonna send out a quick um, uh, email to all the participants with a, 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 and if you could just shoot us a like a one minute impression of how, how the meeting was for you, that'll give us a little bit of a sense of what the experience was for, for the people on the, on the call in the meeting. And one of the questions is, was the breakout valuable? I um, also want to mention that we have uh, Vermont Center for Training, uh, Family Studies has a symposium coming up in June, which I'm assuming it'll probably be online. And that's a, that's a meeting where you get to hear about six or seven different amazing stories. I think that's the, usually the way it goes. Sometimes it's research that pertain to family leadership. I've always thought this is an extraordinary meeting. And uh, almost excited about the idea of having it go online because it could make it more national. We have people in this on this call from Florida, California, Chicago. So, um, yeah. So we'll be back at the same time next week with the same Zoom login information um, for those who want to. And we'll probably put out a little signal uh, via our our um, our email blasts about what the topic might be. And as, as you know, I was thinking this can be a resource for people. We'll probably just keep doing this as long as it's of value, um, trying to be of service and, and provide a place for people to maybe stop and pause and do some thinking about family leadership and about family success during this time. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll stay with you if, if you wanna stay with us. And, we have op we have opportunities to bring in guests that we know people who are really wise in this area, so um, I don't think it would be hard to fill up a, a long series of meetings if that's what it, if this turns out to be a really long slog. <laughs> um, so we just have a couple more minutes. I'm curious if anybody wants to send a question in by chat. Uh, something we can try. Now, Cami, what are you what are you taking away? What's what's kind of the what struck you here as we as we wind down? 
I think I'm so struck by just um, the universal experience of this um, and how unusual that is, you know, um, and and within it, there's variation in terms of how people are doing and how they're managing. And, um, mm -hmm. and I think that can stimulate a lot of thinking about where is there opportunity um, for me to understand a little bit better, you know, um, what's happening in my realm, um, what might be my role in that, how might I understand that a little bit better, um, and from that, do I have more options, right? Um, it's got me thinking more about that stuff. Yeah, uh, someone just asked about lack of control. There's so much we can't control in life anyways. And mm -hmm. boy, it's really big right now. And I think, you know, families are, are they have the potential to bring us the greatest joy and they also have mm -hmm. the potential to bring us the greatest misery. Mm. They have tremendous power <laughs> in both directions. And one of the main ways people manage the challenge of families is by taking space from the family. That's yeah. disrupted. And then the other way, um, I don't know, just other relationships, you know, like, I, like the relationships kids have with their friends takes the pressure off the relationships they have with their family. So there's a lot that's disrupted. Right. Um, I think on the control point, I'm going to just end with sharing a, a quote um, that I think is very relevant to that. At least I'm going to try to do that. Here it is. Mm. 2,000 years old. It's so applicable to right now. All right, folks, wishing, wishing you the best. Thank you for joining us. And uh, we'll see some of you next week. Wishing you the very best in managing this. Take care, everyone. <laughs>